How's it? It's Mark. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I appreciate you so much for joining us. To my On The Mark audio listeners who've come over here and gotten visual with us, welcome tribe. It's good to have you. Just a reminder, we are here for you. The mission behind this vodcast is to bring you bright minds, thought leaders, great ideas to help you to better information, to lots of knowledge, but most importantly, understanding so that you can make smart decisions for your golf game and obviously improve and lower your scores. That is why we exist. Along those lines, you can find some video golf tips here. You can also go to my social media handles. I put tips, tricks, all sorts of golf stuff over there on Instagram and Twitter. The handle is at Mark underscore Immelman. Go ahead, follow me over there. And I do TikTok. The handle on TikTok is Mark Immelman. Just a reminder too, the website handle is markimmelman.com. You can find on the mark merchandise and you can find promo codes, discount codes to all manner of stuff that will help you with your game, help you to look sharp and help you to measure your game. We've got launch monitors, training aids, footwear, apparel, the whole thing over there. So go to markimmelman.com, go get yourself a discount code to get whatever you need to help your game. Again, thanks for downloading this one. Appreciate you so much. If you folks, and you can watch for this on YouTube, if you've been wondering where it was, because I think I might have teased this on social media. Well, it's all on me, but finally I got me arranged and I've got Tony Luzak on the line. You can watch him on YouTube. He's all smiley right now. For the audio listeners, Tony, welcome. So good to see you. Oh, Mark, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, especially talking with you with uh, your experience and, and insights. This is just an honor for me. Thank you. No, I'm going to turn that around. The honor is mine. And I'll tell you why, because look, deep down, I'm a golf nerd. I'm a junkie. And I'm one of those guys that sort of goes down rabbit holes, you know, and I, and I find something and then I search and then, you know, the algorithm finds you and the algorithm has found me with your YouTube account. <laughs> and I've spent a whole lot of time watching your stuff. So it's a thrill to have you. Well, I appreciate it. I look forward to to our conversation. Well, to that, let's put you into context, please, uh, for our global audience. Tony Luzek, um, you've been in golf teaching over 25 years, I believe it is. Please give us uh, the brief bio, how, how you came to where you are. Well, well, we'll keep it short. So I actually wanted to be a player. In the back in the day, in junior college days, you know, I wanted to be the next Jack Nicklaus, Tom Weisskopf. Uh, but I was also studying computer engineering. And I had to make a decision. Now, back in those days, I, in hindsight, may have made a wrong decision, but I chose golf and tried to play um, and had success in Michigan. Then I went to Mississippi State to walk on and do the professional golf management program. Hurt my back, grew four inches, a lot of different things happened. But it, it was always my interest into learning more, probably with that engineering background that got me into it. So finished up school, never did play here at Mississippi State. Uh, went to work for the PGA Tour and the TPC Network. Right. And that was a great opportunity to start continuing playing, trying to play. But every time I got back into playing, I really grinded it out. My back went out. But um, And then teaching was one of those things that I remember the first desktop computer system from Neat Vision um, was a $10,000 system. I had when that. I showed, I'm dating Did myself. you have that? I, I had that. Yes, I, I've I've been a part of the Sony Handicam era. I had my neat vision to start. I went to JC Video. I, I yeah, I've done it all. Now now so, everything's, yeah. now everything's done on that thing over there. My television. Yes, ex exactly. <laughs> so you know, because I think I got you by about five or six years. But so, mm -hmm. but one thing I, I did is I always thought I needed to know more to become a better player. So I would take a lot of lessons and continuing uh, learning more. And then when I looked back at it, my game got worse, but there's times where I'd have great nine hole rounds and shoot four, five, six under, but then not be able to continue it. So I knew there was always more information, but I was just, it never worked. Mm -hmm. And when I looked back at it and I kind of regressed sh shortly is I had an opportunity back when I was a student here at Mississippi State. Uh, to hang out with this gentleman named John Daly for about three months. Now, he wasn't so John, <laughs> yeah, and this was before John won the PGA Championship. But, mm -hmm. you know, when we played together, I mean, he compressed the ball like no one else. Mm -hmm. Putted, like, with unbelievable touch. And it was no, really... And, and you know what? And, and I was a caddy back then. 
um, okay. and he played a bunch in South Africa. And that putting yeah. stroke was like, it was sort of loose handed, if you will. There was all sorts of flow to it. It certainly didn't look fundamentally correct, but the guy hold it from all over the show. I mean, it was one of those things that we just were, I was mystified about what he would do. And so, you know, we, we hung out a ton and it was, it was like, John, how do you do it? When he says grip it and rip it, that's about as really deep as it went. And I, yeah. and, you know, it's like, well, I thought you'd have to know more, you know, and that was kind of that search. Then I remember reading the golf machine back in the day. So for me, that was the reason why I kept diving more and more into the instruction and but what I realized is when I started giving lessons, people didn't want to know about the information that I knew. They just wanted to get better. And so, thinking, yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's like, OK. And I was teaching, you know, down at TPC Persantia with PJ Tour Network and, and working with guys like Paul Azing or Steve Rintoul at the time, uh, a bunch of senior tour players mm -hmm. um, and really kind of more or less educated myself and. One thing I realized is that a lot of things that I I was trying to teach, I was more of a, a we'll say for a trail side hand control and a right yeah. arm control guy. And part of that came from the golf machine. Part of that came from Mike Bender and the, the Mac information. Mm -hmm. But um, I also knew in talking with these players, they had different feelings behind all of that. So for me, it was always a search of, I need to know more. And uh, But it, that killed my playing career completely. But it kept me on a path to continue learning how to uh, to just to keep searching. I kept searching and searching, which is not good for business. Research and development does not make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. So my teaching business kind of was up and down. And, and, and so after my days on the tour, I went up to work for Family Golf Center and spent some time up in New York, why upstate New York as a golf pro. But I was traveling back and forth and mm -hmm. And, and then had an opportunity to come back down to Mississippi State University and run their golf course. So I was director of golf and really kind of got more into the, the science behind it. Um, I picked up my, my little bro's uh, biomechanics book. He was doing physical therapy uh, training at the time. And he was uh, uh, working for some of the professional teams back in Michigan. And it's like, okay, this is where I wanted you to go. And started doing some research with the kinesiology department. And actually did some uh, electromyography research, some EMG research on the golf swing. And, and I'm just a golf pro, just a club pro. You know, back, I got my bachelor's degree, but that was it. Yeah. And, and presented it in 2014 at the World Scientific Congress of Golf in Australia. And it was great. Griff, Griffiths University on, on the Gold Coast. And it was just an awesome place. And that's when I realized I needed to go back to school. Because it was me, maybe one or two other pro club pros I was presenting, and I had all these PhDs and, uh -huh. and everybody. It was intense. Some of the questions, it's like, ah, I know it this deep, and you're asking this type of question. I, I need to go. I need to get educated. And so now you have your PhD in uh, various things. Uh, you, you've said a couple of things that I sort of want to drill down on, and you said something to the effect of, you know, I, I never thought I knew enough or, I, or I, I didn't think I was good enough. And I was having a conversation on the golf course the other day with Ian Baker Finch, major champion, you know, knows a lot about the game and right. sort of a wise soul. You know, he blends the new and the old beautifully. And I said to him, I'm like, you know, what's crazy in my career as a golfer, teacher, broadcaster guy. When I was teaching, even though I was successful, I always thought that there was something more. And now yeah. I guess at age 52 and holding on for dear life, I'm like, I'm looking back on this going, golly, I almost want to write a letter entitled dear younger me, you know, <laughs> what, you know, what you knew back then was, it was right. It was sufficient. And this continual search you reference, or you talk about some in, in your own endeavors, whereas I learned a lot more. It's almost like even my own playing career suffered because I always thought there had to be something else. Exactly. I mean, that, that that's well said. And I think that's where we, you know, going back to school, get my master's uh, in kinesiology, neuromechanics, and then my PhD in human factors engineering. It really allowed me to understand how the brain processes information mm -hmm. and how we learn. And I'm finding out that, you know, how we learn is more important than maybe the information. So, you know, if you were, 
a simple analogy is riding a bike. I mean, how many books have you read or maybe taught your, your, your kids here, read this book on how to ride a bike and let's, let's go do it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't work that way. We don't, we don't work that way as human beings. You know what, that, that, you know, in itself, and I can see why you've done all this research about it, just that could keep you busy nonstop. And, and you, because, because here's the thing about golf, it's difficult. Yes. Uh, and, and I often t say golf is a simple game, but it's not easy. And so the right. first thing we do is we want to get better. So you go for a lesson. Then the lesson identifies one thing. And oftentimes that thing as kind of an indirect, if you will, influence on the game. And, and then you've done a beautiful job, which I'm going to get to, talking about the hands and the arms and the wrists in the golf swing, which to me are the tip of the spear. But that's that's coming in our conversation, where I, I feel like then golfers are like, well, I've got to do this and I mustn't do that, and I've got to do this and I mustn't do that. And all of a sudden, they're playing crappy and they're laying out money on golf instructors, equipment. Uh, it, it's just a... a a never ending stream of funds going out yet. They're still, you know, suffering and not playing the game to their athletic ability. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about that athletic ability because that is being around some of the great athletes. And I've been around one of the, the greatest, Michael uh, Jordan. Mm -hmm. We played some golf together back in the day when he was playing uh, baseball with the White Sox organization. So he lived on property and, and his, you know, his mindset was different. His approach was different. And I would give him some instruction and we'd get him going. But he also knew how to turn off the information and just become an athlete. And, and he, 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 was, he always tr hedged his bets really well and would, would get you to give him too many shots. But his <laughs> mindset is really what made it fun to be around and realize, okay, it is a different way of thinking if you want to become a really good athlete. And, um, and so that's, that's been kind of now the, the deep dive into our, our research is how can we quantify in a way, uh, smoothness and skill and motor control and learning, but deliver that in a simple way through analogies. And I think that's, that's been kind of a secret from an instruction standpoint. So, you know, I've, I've had some, some success as a teacher. One of my students won the uh, world long drive championship and he with phenomenal golf swing we mm -hmm. built him a, he wanted a golf swing um and so i knew it created speed and created power but it may not be the fastest but it was long long enough really long like 463 yards long okay. but the ball always went dead straight so i knew some of the approach of combining the neuromechanics with how we learn the motor skill and motor uh, control and learning is that's really where I think golf and golf instructors need to go in order to help their students better. Okay, Mia culpa. I am having a tough time directing this conversation because inside of my head, I've got about 50 <laughs> things going on right now. So I'm going to try and keep this on the track. Um, I want to talk about Jeff because you basically, the methodology you worked on with him and Jeff Flagg being the world long driving right. champion you worked alongside. Um, you used a methodology of thinking, training, and practicing. I want you to explain that, but before I go there, um, you have developed basically what's an effective method for producing repeatable and powerful swings. Now, I always bristle when I hear the term method when it comes to golf instruction. And when I read that, I'm like, Ugh. and then when I watch your videos, I was like, Man, this is so easy to to apply. And it's not like... I'm, I don't want to pick on anyone, but there, there's no real methodology to it, but the approach to it was so simple, so athletic, um, and, and more importantly, easy to go and practice and work on. So explain that a little bit, please. Yeah. I mean, there's no perfect method. It's just, like you said, it's an approach. Mm -hmm. It's a guideline, you know, we let people discover it and that's really kind of leads the conversation. But, you know, we started with, you know, first of all, Jeff is a phenomenal athlete, six, six long arms he had the genetics to do but he had that baseball swing so we had to convert him into golf so you know one of the things that i'll uh, i use my props it's a hammer if you know how to use a hammer and throw mm -hmm. a ball but in golf we hammer it sideways uh -huh. so now this trail hand is everything follows that so the thinking was more of using simple physics simple biomechanics 
and to to basically already tap into what the person knows how to do. Um, so this way, he knew how to throw a ball, mm-hmm. but we had to change his timing from a baseball, which is more of an overhand type of motion, to more of an underhand type of motion. So the accelerations are different. Mm-hmm. But it's this same approach that he understood that how the club worked is the hammer. That made sense to him. So his thinking then could then start getting reduced when he started to perform and practice and train. For the for the YouTube viewers, you can see what Tony was doing there with he had a mallet in his hand and was basically working it in a horizontal plane. For the audio listeners, though, I want to say this because I way back in the day, maybe it was an, a moment of inspiration that I had. I took an old hammer head and I had a club maker stick it onto the end of a golf shaft. And I used to use this. Now, it's different to a golf club because the golf club has the the sweet spot removed from where the shaft goes into the head. But this drill basically had the shaft and the hammerhead sitting, or the shaft going straight into the hammerhead. And I used to give to students that were moving excessively and at the wrong time and too much, maybe in an effort to turn or maybe in an effort to shift their weight. You know, all the stuff they've heard in the grill room kind of thing. Right. And I'm like, okay, if this was your golf club and I asked you to direct that straight into the back of the golf ball, show me how you would do that. And all of a sudden, they would unhinge this thing at the right time. There would be more precision about them. Their physical, their torso movement would be a whole lot less drastic and violent. And then I'm like, well, hit the ball like that. And then they would hit the ball better. But then they're like, but... I'm not turning my shoulders or I'm not doing this. I'm like, yeah, you are, but you're doing so within reason. So that's why I love what you're saying because no one could ever sort of quantify how much and when you should turn and how much, you know, all these sorts of things that you're sort of hearing from biomechanics and such. Well, we're actually starting to be able to quantify that a little bit yeah. um, through some of our technology we're working on with our startup company. But um, you really, as a golfer though, you're right. I mean, the, the physics of the club head to the ball. And I've been fortunate to be around um, some of the engineers that, that develop the golf robot that you see with the manufacturers. We know that the path of this club head has to be within plus minus three degrees. Mm-hmm. And the face has to be perpendicular to target for the ball to go straight. Yeah. So you, obviously, whether you use track man or foresight, I'm a foresight guy. Um, and I've been with them right from the beginning is we can now quantify that club head delivery into the ball. And again, it lines up just like the hammer. We know that ball flight is center masses have to line up. And if we come in at different angles of that nail, we're going to bend the nail, which is bending ball flight. So again, it gave Mm -hmm. people that understanding and gave Jeff the freedom to just go fast. Now, one of the biggest things that we ran into and we, we can, I labeled it as a gorilla swing, which is what the guys, a lot of guys are doing now. You see how big they are, and they're just flying all over the place. And I will say, yes, that is probably the fastest way to move a golf club. Yeah. But from a from a predictability standpoint, you, you it's not going to work, you know. But long drive, you only needed one. But uh, Jeff wanted a golf swing, so we actually built it off of a different type of timing, and the people have just. And instructors have just ridiculed me about using the hands and arms to create velocity. It's great. But, 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 but hold on a second. There's so much we can talk about here. First off, <laughs> I want to backtrack because certain words will jump out of the computer or the, the radio, whoever, the phone, whatever folks are listening to you on. And they hear gorilla swing, okay, which I think is a great <laughs> way of describing it. Because I, you know, I never really got golf lessons as a kid. I was a voracious reader. But I do remember the wisdom of our old golf pro. And he said to me, Mark, he goes, the woods are filled with long hitters. Now, look, that is true. But on the other side of the coin, power is a separator. Yes. And every golfer, they hear that and they're like, well, I'm going to hit for more power and I'm going to leverage the ground. I'm going to rotate my body and blah, 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 blah. (laughs) And you're laughing because, you know, these folks are spray gunning the golf course, yet fast, okay? Is that what you're saying about the gorilla swing? Is that what Sort of, sort of. 
it's it's one of those. So you know, it was it, it was. Let me pose this question. Let's flip it around for a second. Okay. I, I use a lot of questioning techniques in my lessons. So when when you know, as you a player or a teacher, and your best shots or your best swings that you've ever made versus your poor shots, effort wise, how much effort did those good shots take versus those poor shots? A whole lot less. A whole lot okay. less. Okay, so now let's think about that. So that means there was less work, okay? In our body, muscles do the work. We don't get power from the ground. Sorry, drug reaction forces don't work that way. God, you're about to get ripped on Twitter. <laughs> I, it's fine. You know what? That's the reason why I went back to school, Mark, is because <laughs> now I have all the research, and it's not my opinion anymore. I can pull out research papers, and if we want to squash everything right now, Look, look, here's the thing. And here's the thing. I've got to make the statement, then I'm going to let you have the floor. I support what you're saying. And I will have folks on here that will talk about rotary action and they all shut club faces. It's important. Yeah, yeah it, it is important. But one of my favorite golf books that sits on my bedside table is Swing the, the, the Club Head by Ernest Jones. <laughs> all right. That's and I give, I give people the Ernest Jones golf lesson, and I you can see their eyes are like widened like this. And they go, but I'm swinging so softly and the ball's going so far. And I'll counter with, yes, because golf is more to me a game of precision than what it is of power. Because power is a, re a result of the precise strike, to get back to your hammerhead analogy, into the back of the golf ball, the transfer of energy. Transfer of, exactly. So yeah. efficiency behind this effortless power is really what, Ernest Jones talks about and 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 a lot of the great instructors, Bob Tosky. I mean, yeah. hitting balls off your knees and you know, Jim Flick, and, same thing. Jim yeah. Flick, exactly. Um, and, and kind of tying this back into Jeff is, I remember being out at out in Vegas, out in Vegas for prepping for the the event, and we got him on the range, and I'm having him do the flamingo drill. One of my students who now is up at Lee One University, yeah. yeah, she she called it the flamingo drill. Uh, Hannah Grace did, and and so it just stuck. And I got him swinging. He hit the ball. I got my flight. I see flight scope. I got my flight scope right there. Hits the ball four hundred yards dead straight off of one leg. <laughs> you know, tell tell you know, me, yeah. speed come, speed does not come from the hips. And if we want to get into core, the difference between correlation and causation, I'm happy to pull out. Meyer's paper that says, I guess I am right now, that says there's no causation between hip speed and club head speed. Okay. But I'm gonna stop, good marketing. I'm gonna stop you there. We're gonna make that another podcast because because I'm wanting to keep this because <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we could go on forever. Yeah. I, you gotta I, keep me straight, Mark. I'm 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 just one of those. I got a lot of things going on up here. Yeah, and it's too. like your job is to help keep this conversation going in the right direction. Well, along what you said where Jeff hit the ball four hundred yards of one leg. Um I, back in the day when I was teaching full-time, I would split some time between Europe and South Africa. And because of the opposite hemispheres, a lot of European folks would come to South Africa because it was cheap for them to play golf. The weather was great. And uh, I was on a European the European tour then. And then they'd see my name. They're like, well, I'm getting this guy for half the price down there in South Africa than what he was over there. So I taught a lady. Um, I'll never forget. She was the captain of the German ladies national golf team. Wow. Was an absolute flusher could not hit a wedge inside of 30 yards for her life uh, it was it was almost borderline yippy and it was a function of where someone had said to her you got to turn your body the whole thing and you got to shift your there was so much movement that she landed the club in the wrong place all of the time so it was drop kicks thins fats shanks yep. the whole lot. and so i gave her my version of the flamingo drill where okay. I had her on her left leg only, so the pressure was forward, knees together, right foot just on the tiptoe. And Perfect. I put the ball inside of her big toe of her left foot, and I gave her the wedge. I'm like, okay, hit the ball to there. And she hit it, and she, she struck it well. And her face sort of lit up. The ball went too far. But she was like, oh, my goodness, I struck it, and it's in the air kind of thing. And so we kept on doing this. And then I'm like, make it go farther. And she would make it go shorter. And she would and like open the face. And all of a sudden, because the landing point was correct, she could hit anything. And I'll never forget, <laughs> Tony, she said to me, she goes, I do this in a tournament. I'm like, I don't, whatever you want. Yeah. Because it's working, right? So 
she puts, exactly. signs up for a local event there in South Africa. I've got some time off. I go out there and watch. Third hole's a par five. Drive a three wood short of the bunker. Tight lie over this bunker to a green running away from you. And I'm like, oh, hell. And I'm saying my Hail Marys and stuff for her. <laughs> she gets into the flamingo thing there. Clips it away over the bunker to about five feet, makes four. And the smile on her face is gigantic. And she looked at me. She goes, I do it. And, and, and it's awesome. Again, because when you're in that environment, like the your flamingo, and that's one of your analogies, I'm certain, you know, where it's like yeah. your body can move in a certain area and your arms and your wrists and that sort of stuff can present the club face to its path and the ball appropriately. Exactly. And we don't have to say anything as instructors. And now the, the, that golfer can feel and and go, oh, this is how I do it. Their their discovery of that feeling is a pure motor learning principle, mm -hmm. and they can then relate it to you. And, and they say, you know, they may even say, well, I'm not sure how I do it, but I can do it every time. And that is the ultimate motor learning concept is where they know how to do it, but they can't tell you how they do it because now they're not processing that information. Tell me if I'm crazy because you've jogged my memory here. Uh, uh, well, it was down at the Zurich Classic of New Orleans when it was still an individual event. Okay. And Justin Rose won at the one here, and I was on the call for PGA Tour Radio back then. And, you know, I'm a teacher, and I watched him hit coming down the stretch, and it was tremendous. And he was coming off a horrid slump. And I, I pitched him the first question afterwards. I'm like, just your thoughts. And he gave me the typical answer. And I'm like, okay, Justin, you played great coming off the slump what gives and he goes well i hooked up with foley that's sean foley and you know sean tends quite technical he's, he's actually right. changed his course now of late oh, okay yeah so and he goes i said to Foles, he's like i'm like all of the stuff you're showing me is great but my feels are sacred yes. because to give me this information it's got to be a feel and there's yes. certain feels that i know work Yep. And so they sort of gave and uh, there was some give and take going on there and they blended the information with what turned into a feel and Justin had something he could go to. So now I say that in on the heels of what you say, where it's like, okay, you take the cerebral, you turn it into something that you can sense. It's sort of immeasurable in a way, but it's yours. And then you know what you can go to. Yes. Yes, very much. So when we look at the human body, and we look at pro it's proprioception. That's our sensors for how we do things, mm -hmm. you know, and it's right here. And, and if you want all the details, we can get into homogulous man and everything else. But our hands are so sensitive and so refined that we can now sense where we're doing. You know, we can tell where we are in space and close our eyes and still have a sense for it. And the best players in the world have phenomenal sense of their existence. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. We use sensors now to to measure that, but then it's not the data that we want to give players. It's like, here's the data, but what did it feel like? Oh, that's the feel. Okay, perfect. Let's go with the feel. I don't need to teach you how the machine was built. I know how the machine was built, know how the golf club was done, know how the body's working in the mind. But now what did that feel like? Okay, yes. So this is three degrees. That's a straight shot. Oh, that's what it feels like. Perfect. Yeah, keep doing that. And they, they continue to have success. So it's just understanding that how the body and the mind works. You know, this is a single processing unit. Yeah. But we can't, you know, it's it's our feeling is so critical. And even though feeling and real feels and reels uh, may not be the same, but it doesn't matter. And that's the thing I learned from some of the best players in the world. You know, I remember giving Dick Ryan a lesson. He was a senior tour guy at the time. And I'm telling him about all this right hand trail hand stuff and, He's pure in it, just striping it, right? Mm -hmm. And he's kind of looking at me just, you know, that's just his personality. He's a great guy. And he goes, okay, give me give me some time. Walk, go away, and, and I'll come back and tell you. And he walks up to the shop, and he goes, I got it. And he points to his, like his, his lead hand, his little muscle right here off his mm -hmm. forefinger. And I said, great, keep doing it. Because, again, that was his sensation of how to control the club. I'm not going to, I can't tell you what you feel. We know there's some, some generalities that we can have, but I can never tell you what you feel in a golf swing. I don't, we're not wired like that yet. You know, now you're opening me up because <laughs> 
two teachers talking to each other with fans from around the world listening. I think the most dangerous golf lessons, dangerous, come from PGA Tour professionals or European Tour professionals or whoever, because they're not necessarily teachers. They might know what they got to do and what they got to feel, and that's what they will pass on to you. And then the next thing, you're trying what they're doing. So I want you to convince the folks here to say, hey, what you're feeling might be different to Joe over there, but if the ball's doing the right thing, you're on the way. And if you're staying inside of your boundaries, if you will. Yeah. So, I mean, that is such a, a great comment you made there, Mark. Um, let's take, I'm just going back to some of the, my personal experiences. As a tour player, there are certain skills that are so automatic, they don't even think about. Yeah. So arm swing is one of them. Their arm swing I can tell you right now, they don't think about their arm swing. That club's moving, the arms are moving, everything else. So they actually feel more of the weaknesses in their swing. So, for example, it may be pelvis rotation. That's one of them. I've had some players, well, I feel more pelvis or more body through impact. I said, great, you should. But it's probably, you know, it doesn't matter where it is. And I know numbers-wise, it's more upper body than it is lower body because lower leg is more of a post that we're working off of. But they feel things that are kind of like their weak point that they're oh. trying to sink up. And all of a sudden, then, like you said, that information becomes, yeah, I feel like my hips are doing all the work. Oh, you can't, can't rely on the small muscles. You got to use the big muscles to be consistent. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, have I ever gone to the dentist and asked the, the, the hygienist to use her big muscles to clean my teeth? <laughs> I'm sorry, Brian. No, well, that thought in your head. Oh, well, again, this is I'm taking this back to me because, like I said to you before, we went hot here. Um, I don't necessarily interview; I listen like a golf fan. And um, back when I was a kid, I was a good golfer, and I was a voracious reader. To my own benefit, now I was looking upon this in hindsight, but back then it was dangerous. And I read somewhere that you're going to use the big muscles. So the one day I'm playing in this tournament and I'm hitting it like dog's breakfast. I mean, it is, everything's out of the heel. Everything's weak, right? And I was trying to, you know, rotate my body and hit with my big muscles. And I'll never forget his name. His name, his name was Paul Van Hennigan. He was a good player, but he had a sharp, sharp wit. And I hit this tee shot in like the fourth or fifth hole, kind of scrubbed up the right-hand side, nothing behind it. And I complain, I'm like, I, I've, I've, I've got to use my big muscles more. And Paul goes, Mark, you don't even have any big muscles, so I don't know what you're trying to use over there. And, and you know, as he said that, I kind of felt conspicuous. I felt like a bit of a dumbass, honestly, because he was ripping on how small I was. He's like, you don't have big muscles. You know, they're all relative here. And then the next hole, I fagged the big muscle thing, and I started to hit it like I normally do, and I played pretty well after that all. Stop thinking, stop trying to force it. Your brain could just, and body could just work together and the way things went more of how they should have. Um, you know, and that, that, that is my goal is being able to quantify some of that, not for the, the student, but for me. In, and that's where, um, you know, in, in golf, uh, and I'll bring some of the math into it a little bit, but we have positions and we have velocities, we have accelerations. Do you know what the next derivative is after an acceleration? It's jerk. Uh, I thought it was about to say deceleration. Or was that part? No, of it's it? so deceleration is just then that obviously the the negative ex change oh, okay, right. of, mm -hmm. of of acceleration, but the the third derivative of position is jerk. Okay, and which it's like why they come up with this name, but it makes sense. Not for a golf when, swinger, <laughs> jerk sounds so uh, kind of jerky. Yeah, so we can now quantify. I started posting some stuff on this to quantify that if you have a high jerk swing, your your time and your coordination is way off, which goes right back into those poor swings that take a lot of work because mm -hmm. you're jerking the body and miscoordinating between the arms and the body, and it will never work. And then mathematicians being as, try to be comical, the next derivatives after jerk is snap, crackle, and pop. And it's like, it is, seriously, it is. But we, we can stay at the jerk side, but it's really smoothness. We can now 
to measure smoothness in a golfer's swing, not just from a video from the aesthetics. We can now actually measure that with technology and be able to now train you. But guess what it goes back into? All the flamingo drills, the feet together drill. I remember seeing Hale Irwin do feet together drill back in the 70s. You know, uh, and it is swinging a golf club. So we, we we just, how do we look at making that happen? And, and um, you know, what? yeah, so... Uh... Again, I'm making this about me. I, I've got one of those swings. If I post it, everyone's like, wow, great swing, pro, great swing, pro. And I hit the thing horribly. But but uh, <laughs> but you talk, because I look smooth. It, it's rhythmic. Yes. It's yes. aesthetically pleasing. And, and and it sort of gets me thinking of if I posted this out online and I said, Tony and I were chatting, who to you has got the best swing in the world's game right now? He would probably hear Rory McIlroy, the lion's share of the time. Yes? No, you agree? Perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would say people would look at that maybe like an Adam Scott is yeah, a little Adam, bit smoother. Yeah. Adam's, yeah, Adam's another one. But but you got these two guys that everything looks like it's well-timed and is going together. And then you've got other golf swings like, uh, let me tell you something, Victor Hovland, it's a, as good, if not better, as the two of those guys, maybe not as long as Rory, but it just kind of looks ungainly a little bit. Uh, and, 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 and so everyone th- equates this, I guess it's the jerk thing. You know, if everything's yeah. working like it should, the swing looks good and it hits the ball um, freely and powerfully as well. Because let me tell you, I was on Adam Scott like a few weeks ago at the Wells Fargo in 2023. He was smashing it off the tee. I'm absolutely ripping it off the tee and not breaking a sweat. Okay. So you've seen it firsthand where people, golfers um, will have, and this gets back into a little bit more of the, the neuromechanics. So and this goes back to so the original neuromechanicist uh, Bernstein out of Russia that did measuring, again, he used a hammer. That's the reason why I do it. And mm-hmm. he measured an expert, you know, uh, I guess, what is it, metal smith. Uh, yeah. and, and the movements of the hammer varied con- constantly. There was no consistency, but that delivery into the final object all came together. Wow. And the human body does not want to do the same thing over and over and over again because it would basically hurt itself. So the brain goes, you know what? I'm not going to be consistent, but I can be consistently delivering a golf club into the ball or a hammer into the nail. But there's got to be variations because the strategy, the the muscle synergy, how the brain works and how you're feeling, eating and stuff like that. Can, um, well, there's always going to be variants. It's a matter of how we control those variances. You know, in the Bible, there's oftentimes you'll see that phrase, selah, which means take a minute and consider. What you've just said there about how the brain won't let you do the same thing all of the time. Uh, we could stop the podcast right now. And that would <laughs> seriously, I believe unshackle so many golfers from trying to propel this club around them somehow. And they're working yeah. so hard and sacrificing what the body naturally does or the brain naturally does. Exactly. And it's really, you know, if, if golfers would spend more time, again, I'm a, industrial systems engineering is my PhD, human factors engineering. It's, a, it's all about his systems, human and, and the golf club in this case. You know, if we look at it, Christopher Knight did a great uh, paper on the neuromotor issues and learning and control of the golf skill. And, and really, his perspective is, which I believe 100%, is the swing path of the golf club relative to the body position. The body position doesn't produce the path. The path produces the body position. Touchdown. Are you okay, Mark? <laughs> no, folks, if you were watching on YouTube, I just leaned back and took a deep breath and raised my arms like hallelujah. I I, I want to I want to drill on that a little bit, and I've kept you for so long already, and the things I've got to get to. Um, but it's amazing. Uh, someone explained it to me. He goes, Mark, if you're just reaching out to pick up your pen, your brain's organizing stuff around getting your hand to the pen, but it's all about where your hand interacts. It's not like, well, I'm going to, like you said, I'm going to move my shoulder first or I'm going to rotate. <laughs> that happens naturally. Yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, it, it has to do with intent. You know, if we're taking the, this hammer into a nail, a golf club into the ball, our intent in, and our proprioception will drive all that. But that's because the golf swing is now a little bit more into the science behind it. It's a ballistic motion. Mm-hmm. So that what that means is, like, if I have a key into a, a to unlock a door, 
Yeah. That's a, a feedback system. It's very slow. I can process and make adjustments. Golf swing is very fast. So it's a feed forward system. So in a sense, we have to know ahead of time. We actually have to pre-plan that action before it happens. And that's where we have to look at acceleration and smoothness and lack of jerk in order to produce a good golf swing. And we can't be processing and thinking about it because it doesn't work that way. Hey, um, you used a word there, intent, that I really want you to build on, please. Because I find, and, and this is why you'll hear all the golfers, well, my practice swing is so much better than when I hit the golf ball. Uh, because when you hit the golf ball, you're trying to hit the golf ball. And I think the term, yeah. of hit, the term hit is ruining folks here. Um, oh, so, definitely. So the intent of like where I'm trying to deliver this club toward, that should sort of be where the focus is to direct the body correctly. Yes? Uh, yes, definitely. The The brain and body doesn't understand negatives. Okay, so it's kind of like that old I'm serious that don't hit it in the water here. Don't 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 hit it in that bunker. Well, what does that do? That actually the brain's in action. Okay. It either, you know, goes in this direction or it goes in that direction, but it doesn't do that. It doesn't do the other thing. It only goes. So yeah. your intent drives what is gonna happen. So your whether that's you staying in the flow, the zone, whatever, your intent of what you want to do has to be i want to take this ball and put it out there kind of from point a to point b and i've played golf tournaments never seen a golf course before and actually have chosen to play in a tournament without a practice round because i had it planned out on paper what i wanted to do and i followed that and my intent was from here to there and then from here to there and i did that i ended up shooting like 65 one day in a tournament <laughs> and because because of that and i should have just stuck with that that approach, but um, then I want to get smart and learn more and keep doing more. But well, if, if that intent is is critical. A few weeks ago, the RBC Canadian Open, Rory showed up there late. All the debacle here in 2023 was, you know, it was the Live PIF PGA Tour <laughs> deal. Rory was getting his press conference was hours long. He didn't even get to see the front nine. And he played the next day and played the front nine, I think, better than he did the nine he had actually seen in the Pro-Am. Because I guess he actually said, he, he looked at us and he said, look, I just hope Harry's walked the place properly and knows where I can hit the thing. And then he played well and someone asked him about it. He goes, you know, sometimes it's liberating not knowing where the trouble is or not having scar tissue about the thing and just making it like purely intent. Like I want to propel the ball there and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I would love, I would love for you to talk to Roy because he, physically he is a, 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 a phenomenal specimen. I met him like decades ago when I was uh, down in Doral at a tournament um, that was doing some stuff with Bridgestone and, and had a chance to hang out with the, in the fitness room with Chris Noss and Dustin Johnson, Roy McElroy at the time. He had big hair and long socks. Um, but so from a talent standpoint, I, I think that's where he gets himself in trouble is, well, one is the club drops way too much underneath. Lines mm -hmm. don't match up. Ball's either going to go right or left, depending on the club face. That should be an easy fix. But his thinking is, there's a lot of scar tissue there. And I think it's really his thinking that's holding him back, not his necessarily ability other than that jerkiness in his swing sometimes that gets him in trouble. Mm -hmm. So tell, tell him we can fix that. All right, I'll, <laughs> I'll mention it. I'll mention it. Okay, uh, things I want to hit, please. Um, yes, sir. Quickly, uh, but I think you've sort of touched this already, but please put a bow on the concept then. Thinking, training, practicing. So is the thinking, the the developing the intent or understanding with you, by use of an analogy or something, then the training of that, and uh, just walk us through that, please. So yeah. people can take, so, a, so it, take something away. So it's getting away. organized. Yeah, it's okay. getting organized. So let's let's say you're a slicer. Okay. So we're going to train you how to think about what you have to do to deliver this club at a two degree inside and in, inside out path in a square club face. Okay. So now you're training. Well, let's create, whether it's a station or again, I use a lot of foresight. Okay. You're going to practice on this foresight and I want you to just practice and we're just going to give you feedback on that. And I also use video. I use live video where players can see themselves, whether it's a TV, I've used video glasses where players can actually see themselves move in real time. Mm -hmm. And so now their training is consistent. And again, not perfect. We say consistency, a, a railway, 
is consistently delivering this and they develop the feel and that's what it is. It's not, so they've got the thinking, the analogies, the training is how do I organize this to get a feel? And then it's now just going out and playing and performing. I am assuming that when you're doing this with a client, elite or even beginner, some of the stuff is sort of done in slow motion, like a kata in in karate, in karate or something like that, to to really drill down on on what the feels are, as opposed to just trying to go full speed and hoping you get it correct. Great, great point. I will sometimes take the person and let's say, like I'll use, I'll start them out. I don't start them out with flamingo drill, and we'll say we'll hit some balls feet together. And I could just take someone that's never played before in about 15, 20 minutes, get them swinging a club, but it's it is very slow. It is just feeling it. And if they lose the feel, we may go back down to a one-handed swing that moves the club about three feet and just taps the ball. And they just feel that effortless motion with the trail arm. Nothing wrong with the lead arm, but that's a default fault arm. Yeah. But all of a sudden they feel that and they go, oh, that's it. And then we build up from there and then we can speed up. If you try to go fast, it, it's not going to work. People need to be able to, pro- to have a feel for what they're doing. Mm. Okay. Now I do want to put a bow on this entire conversation. I've added a whole lot to my legal pad pad over here. I haven't stayed on course at all. Um, The ABCs of the golf swing, Um, the arms, hands, wrists. Give us uh, the broad stroke and and I, I use analogies too. So talk about the ABCs and then share an analogy with regard to that. So the listeners can go, okay, well, this is sort of how I should move in order to somehow strike the ball more consistently. So this gets into more of an acceleration, which is kind of frame it up. It's not about pure moment. In video, we'll never see the arms move first, then the body in the club. We'll never see that. But this has to do with acceleration. And really, once they get up to the top of their backswing, I want their arms to be accelerating. And then at the bottom of the swing, we'll just say roughly shaft parallel to the ground. Now the body kicks in to deliver that club through. And it gets into, there's some other principles about optimal coordination of momentum that says, I want, we need all the segments maximizing the speed down at the bottom of the swing, Mm -hmm. not a hips first, and then the arm, a body, torso, then the hand. Because now it's the old Tiger Woods Olay swing that he did with Peter Kessler and Butch Harmon back in the 1990s that cause people to get out of sync. So it's a matter of the arms body club connection with this trail hand going into extension towards flexion is what compresses the ball. And so by having our feel that outside track has to be accelerating faster in order to stay with the body that's moving much slower, but still moving, but it's moving slower in sync with all that. If the body takes off, arms and club can never catch up. If you want to get a good video of who does that very well, even though it looks kind of funny, Bernard Langer, throughout his entire career, mm-hmm. that guy's been so well-timed. And I feel like it's sort of the hallmark of all of his ball striking, which is pure to this day. I've, I've, I've seen him. I've, I've heard him talk. And I mean, his, his quality over, you know, you think about what he's done in the Champions Tour yeah. and his regular tour. And, I mean, it's phenomenal. So yeah, that time and, and his thinking isn't very complex. It's all about creating shots. And that that was I love that. I saw him uh World Scientific Congress of Golf. I did a couple of presentations and he spoke there and it was really about creating the shots that drove his intent. Mm-hmm. And he just figured out the timing behind it. One more thing and I'll let you comment. Um I'm like you're I'm, you I'm a question answer. As a teacher, um I explain concepts. And then I'm, I'm a big drill user, you know, to build fields and stuff. Um, and feedback, I try and figure out, are they auditory or visual or, you know, because everyone has our bent, you know, which way we're going to understand the best. And the yeah. understanding is what drives this podcast. Exactly. So the first time I was around Nick Feldo, I was intimidated. I was a young teacher in Europe and he has Feldo, top of the game. And I'll never forget off a downhill, I hit this three iron and I've never... It's like it happened in slow motion. This club face was so square onto the back of the ball, and the ball took off off this downhill, climbed, landed on the green very softly. And I remember going, geez, that thing was hit square. Now, it's almost like the the hammer driving the nail straight into the wall in one strike. Mm -hmm. And so I summoned up the courage (laughs) to ask him a question. And I I mumble this like, okay, Nick, um, 
in your opinion, because at this stage he was insular, he didn't talk very much. I'm like, what is the most important thing in the swing? And he looked at me like this, a sort of double took, and he walked down the fairway a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, oh, hell. <laughs> oh, and no. He turned around, he's waiting for me like 20 yards down the fairway, and he's got his three iron in the hand like this. And he's sort of moving it back and forth. And then he starts to go from small to bigger and returning in front of himself. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see me doing this. And he goes, the club head is the farthest journey to move. Make sure it moves the most. This was the most, this was the most important thing to him. And then, then he opened up a bit. He goes, oh, no. Then I said to him, so if you had to do it all over again, what would you do? And he goes, I'd probably practice in front of a mirror a whole lot more than what I have. So what Feldo is saying there is essentially backing up all of your research. That that's nice to hear. That was uh, I was kind of curious on that because, like you said, you know, and, and it is. It just gets down to it's the physics of this hammer and how we would hammer this way, and that's how you know when we put it on an inclined plane for a golf club, that's how the physics works. Now we just have to figure out how you know how we move as individuals. You know, I'm six foot five now. And how we move as individuals is going to be, our swings are going to look different, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, can we coordinate that movement in order to deliver that club to the ball? Yeah. Why would we ever twist a hammer and release the club? Yeah. I mean, this killed me. I mean, this was my move right here because that's what I was kind of taught. I didn't, you know, didn't take lessons till, till after my kind of my playing career and that, that just didn't work. I've got to share one more and I'll let you cap it with information where folks can find you. Um, John Jacobs is my golf teaching mm. idol. I've gotten to learn from a lot of really good ones, including yourself now. Yes. Um, and I remember I spent like 30 minutes with him and it, it's just so simple. And, you know, he's the doctor of golf or was God rest his soul. And so I asked him a question because I was always trying to hit the thing further, farther, and I, you know, I'd read somewhere that I got to lag the golf club on the way down, got to create lag, <laughs> right? So I said this to him, and I never forget he looked at me, and he goes, "Why do you want to delay the golf club? Surely you should just get it there on time." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "I guess," <laughs> and 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 so I, I I say that to look at you and say, "Well, you had your hammer," because look, a lot of folks try and have the club arriving there a bit early for their hands. So it's that timing of how you release that trail hand, release that angle. And so the timing of it, and look at me just putting a big bow on your conversation here, it's when you deliver this thing precisely to the ball, that's where the magic happens. Exactly. And and really, that's the reason why I focus in on the arms, because if the arms accelerate, and I'll wear a watch on the, my, my trail hand, so as this forearm is accelerating, what happens to the lag? It gets creative, then I deliver it. But let's say I want to hit the ball higher. I don't need to change ball position. I can if I, you know, if I want to, but if I change it too much, now the face angles are going to be yeah. off. Mm -hmm. I will have to, I just release this angle sooner. So angle of attack, I don't go into dropping things and sh shallowing. Oh my gosh. Sh you know, what is this angle? How is this shaft being delivered into the ball? I can have a forward leaning shaft and hit the ball super high. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. I can actually swing up on it by just controlling this. And now I create all of these different shots um, or at least help people create them. Cause I haven't, I, I, I'd love to get back into playing, but it's just been a lot of school and a lot of research. And, and now we're, we're doing our, our, our startup company too. Well, you've helped me to, cause when I play golf, I've got about 15 different swing thoughts in my head. And so it's all a mess. You've helped me to simplify this stuff or at least organize it. Um, that's perfect legendary stuff tony where do the folks find you please share a website or social media whatever the handles are where they can get you Every, everything most of the stuff's at uh tony luzak uh, my name is up on youtube and instagram and humo.golf we'll give the plug out for that you know we're de we're taking some sensors and we're actually measuring all this you know if you look at the hands and i got some we, this is actually part of our uh I, my research was on soft robotic sensors Mm -hmm. so we actually have some socks that can measure ground reaction pressures. So uh -huh. now we can coordinate what the hands do, what the lower body does. We're going to be delivering all this. So humo.golf, humanmotion.golf is actually the website. And we're getting that kicked off. But it's it's really about simplifying the complexity behind all of this. Yeah. Well, 
the, my mission with this podcast is to introduce bright minds to the world. It's to, uh, thank you. to, to bring folks information, knowledge, but to make it, to me, the understanding of it all is where the sweet spot lies. And you've helped us with all of that. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Mark. It's been a, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to talk with you about all of this today. I truly enjoyed it. 